to welcome you uh, this afternoon to the Spring uh, Alumni Career Panel entitled, as you know, Global Globalizing Pathways, Integrating the Study of Foreign Language with Interdisciplinary Work in East Asian, Global, and Latin American Studies. Before I introduce our panelists, who are all here, ready to go, I would also like to thank the offices of Alumni Relations and the Career Center for funding today's event and recognize especially the efforts of Laura Meter, who's standing back here. <laughs> and Alicia Johnson, who's sitting somewhere. Where are you? Thank you. Acknowledge uh, my colleagues Kim Bessio, uh, Ben Falaw, who's on his way back from somewhere uh, <laughs> on campus, <laughs> uh, Patrice Franco, and Jorge Olivares for their input and time. Thank you. <laughs> so, the four of our panelists are going to address two questions. I thought you might want to know what they are. <coughs> the first is what role, however, direct or indirect, has the acquisition of a foreign language here at Colby played in the career path you have forged since graduating from Colby? And given this path that you've forged, can you suggest tangible ways for students here, you, those of you who still study with us, currently involved in foreign language and global studies, East Asian studies, and all the other studies that you represent, I don't want to overlook anyone, at Colby to develop their engagement beyond the classroom. And by this we mean internships with NGOs, other forms of social work, foreign language assistance programs, and or employment. So those of you who are graduating, who think you might be graduating this spring, <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll get some great ideas. Our, we have a, a, a new twist to the panel, which is inviting an alum who's going to speak from the employer's point of view. Uh, so the, the employer's perspective on opportunities for job seekers who, pro, who possess foreign language skills. And we've also asked this panelist, who will soon be presented to you, uh, to address which of these skills that you've gained through your study of foreign language are so-called <coughs> employable. So that's an important thing to be thinking about. So after brief introductions of our panelists, I'll just go right down the line with some bios they provided for me. So thank you very much. Um, they will speak, each of them, about eight, ten minutes, and we will end about five o'clock. Uh, but there will be, hopefully, ten minutes before five to uh, take general questions, and then at five o'clock we'll all, hopefully all of you, go up to the pub and you'll be able to uh, eat and drink uh, merrily and uh, continue your conversation. Uh, so our first panelist is Mariah Buckley, who graduated in 2007 with a double major in Spanish and Latin American Studies, and Mariah will thank you. During her time at Colby, um, Mariah was actively involved in volunteer work, sang with the Sirens, and participated in, in Colby Dancers. Upon graduation, she spent a few years working in the nonprofit world, and then decided to pursue a career in healthcare. She is now a registered nurse, and lives in Scottsdale, Arizona, with her fiancé, Chris, Congratulations. <laughs> uh, Zach Fritzhend is a 2008 alum who majored in East Asian studies with a focus on Mandarin. He moved to China and worked for another Colby grad who founded China's oldest specialty coffee roaster. He managed the sales and marketing departments prior to beginning his graduate degree at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He hopes to graduate in May, we hope that he will, right? And has been working part-time for a multinational agribusiness and commodity trading company for the past eight months in the specialty coffee division. It's a mouthful, I know. Yes. <laughs> a mouthful of coffee. Yes. Or do you have samples to share? Yes. Uh, well, we sell to Green Mountain, so. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Abby Hall, 08, right here. Uh, is a program coordinator at Duke's U Duke University's Global Education Office, where she advises students who want to study abroad in Latin America, Spain, Africa, and Turkey. She's originally from Vermont. She lived and worked in Chile for four years after graduating from Colby with a double major in Latin American Studies and then called International Studies. We know we call that global today. 
Abby completed a Master's of International Studies at North Carolina State University in May 2014, where there is no ice nor snow. And, uh, <laughs> And she currently lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with her fiancé. Congratulations. <laughs> Beth Kittredge Stepan is from the class of 04. She is an executive search recruiter for the personal insurance business at Liberty Mutual, where she hires talent for their marketing, claims, Liberty management system, and customer advocacy departments. That's a mouthful. Beth joined Liberty Mutual from Charles Sterling Group, which is a retained executive search firm where she focused on industry analysis, candidate identification, and development for the asset management practice, and has a specialty focus on distribution, marketing, and portfolio management roles. She will tell you if you're interested in the Q&A about what she did before that, uh, but I would like to share that she's a graduate of Colby College that's a big surprise, right? With a dual major in Latin American Studies and Spanish. And our um, fifth panelist is Jen Pope, the class of 96. But she's still younger than I am. <laughs> and she is currently the Director of Reproductive Health and Family Planning at Population Services International, PSI. Uh, PSI makes it easier for people in the developing world to lead healthier lives and plan families they desire by marketing affordable products and services. She will tell you a little bit more about that organization um, in the Q&A and upstairs, I hope, as well. Um, as the Director of Family uh, Planning and Reproductive Health at PSI, Jen provides strategic direction and technical assistance to country programs providing life-saving products clinical services, and behavior change communications. Uh, she did her work here at Colby in French and International Studies, and she speaks a few languages, among them English, French, Bambara, Spanish, and a little uh, Lingala. Without further ado, we will go right down the road. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, it seems like just yesterday I was sitting in your seat, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, I was not a language major per se here. Um, I was said uh, Latin American Studies and Global Studies, um, but I did take a lot of language courses here. Um, and I would say that learning a foreign language directly impacted um, my career path. I, while I was here, I studied abroad in, in Chile for a semester, and um, after I got back, I, um, my senior year, I basically spent either working on my honors thesis or planning how to return to Chile after graduation. <laughs> um, and so the, the path I took to return to Chile was to be an English teacher, um, and I did that for a year and a half, and it was a great experience, um, definitely a learning experience, but I realized that wasn't really path for me, um, and so I quite by accident got hired um, as a study for a study abroad program that was based in Santiago and um, helped American students, quite like yourself, um, to adjust to life in Chile. Um, I used Spanish, obviously, on a daily basis, living in a Spanish-speaking country, um, and even though it was really hard, I spoke Spanish with um, the students from the U.S. who were studying there because it was a language immersion program. Um, and then after a couple years in that job, I decided that I really wanted to um, dedicate my life, I guess, to helping students study abroad. So I came back to the U.S. Um, to get a master's degree in international studies with a concentration in international education. Um, and during grad school, although I didn't have to use my Spanish, um, I definitely wanted to keep it up. So I volunteered um, for a legal aid organization, uh, working with immigrant uh, women who are trying to get a certain type of, of visa. Um, so I was an interpreter for the, for the lawyer. Um, and I also um, did an internship with a community college working with a lot of ESL students. Um, and I guess in my current job, I don't use Spanish, I would say, on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis, um, reviewing contracts in Spanish and syllabi and um, speaking with our overseas staff. Um, so I would say that if I didn't know Spanish, then I definitely would not have um, the job I have today. 
So that's kind of the roundabout way that learning Spanish and speaking Spanish has um, influenced my career path. In terms of, I guess, tangible ways that you can use Spanish outside the classroom, um, how many of you have studied abroad or are planning on studying abroad? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I can say that one of my biggest pieces of advice is to be very intentional about um, choosing your study abroad program and thinking about how that study abroad program can help you um, later on in your career. Um, when I studied abroad in Chile, I mean, at first, obviously, I didn't know that I was going to move back there, but I soon realized that, you know, I really liked this country and I wanted the experience of living there more than just being a student. So I really tried to reach out and make connections while I was a student there with my professors, with my host family, with my friends, friends of friends, etc. Um, and that really helped me later on when I, first when I was doing my honors thesis, I actually went back and did research there. Um, and that was really useful. And then um, when I moved back, um, those connections, you know, helped me first get my English teaching job and then helped me um, get the other job um, working for the study abroad program. So um, I think in my current job now, I, I talk to a lot of students who want to study abroad and that's um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give them is think about study abroad not only as a chance to, you know, get to know another culture and travel and um, which is all great, but also think about how it can benefit you and your future career path. So that's my, my main piece of advice. So, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So unlike Abby, it's been a little while since I've been here, but also since I remember being in your <laughs> shoes. Um, but when I first started at Colby, I actually thought I was going to be an engineer, focused in engineering. So I took a lot of physics and it wasn't in calculus, and it wasn't until computer science that I decided that that's not what I wanted to do, which was a struggle since my father, one of his uh, jobs was around computer science. But I remember talking to friends saying, well, what do you like to do? And I'd always taken French, and I really loved the understanding of different cultures and how we did work. And so I remember looking through the student handbook and just kind of flipping through and reading about uh, international studies, and I thought, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And I actually, so we had to always take a language, and I thought I'd focus maybe on um, European studies. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And I studied abroad um, in France when Colby still had a program in Caen. Um, I don't know if they still do. No, okay. Um, and when I came back, I actually had to take a class in Latin America with Patrice, and that's where really my love of development started around economics as well. And when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, I decided that really if I was going to work in development, I need to have lived in a developing country. And so after I graduated, I had applied to the Peace Corps. And, and I was also a French um, studies major. And so I spoke Spanish or French throughout, but then I also started taking Spanish as well, because I thought that would open up a lot of different opportunities, which is true. Um, and so I joined the Peace Corps, and I remember Patrice saying, well, what if you don't get in? And I had no other plan, so <laughs> I'm glad that I got in. Um, and I thought that I was going to go to a Latin American country. That's where I started doing a little bit more studies. And I learned that if you speak French, they like sending me to West Africa, which was probably one of the best things that happened to me. So I was in Mali, and their language is really important because it's a way to get to know a different culture and understanding. and. Well, it's great that I knew French. I really needed to learn the local language, Bambara. And so you just get thrown into the deep end. But you know, for me, it was really exciting to learn the different language and being able to understand the community better. And then I started working within reproductive health and family planning then. And really, that's how it all started for me. And I worked for an organization in Boston called Pathfinder. Did some work there, and then I went to grad school. Um, I did a dual degree. I did a business degree as well as a master's at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International <coughs> Studies. Science. And so there you do have to take a language and be proficient. Um, I did place out of French, and so I continued taking Spanish because in the field of international development, really something that sets you apart is your language capabilities. It can prevent you from getting jobs or it makes you focus in just certain areas where English is one of the operating languages or maybe some of the Asian countries where they don't have as many broad um, 
languages beyond the specific country. So after I did um, my grad school, I worked at a lot of different places, and I applied to PSI. And I was hired as a field rep in waiting, meaning that they were going to hire me and then send me wherever um, they had a position. And um, I had a choice between Afghanistan, Burundi, Pakistan, Haiti, and then Congo. <laughs> and so um, I ended up going to Congo, which was amazing. Um, and there I worked in, excuse me, there I worked in, I had to know French. And so I guess thinking through in development work, there are certain regions that you would not be able to work if you did not speak the business language. Um, I did learn Lingala, not so much um, because I had to for my day-to-day -day job, but I feel it's important connecting with the different cultures and the staff that I was working in. And also as a manager, I wanted to know what they were saying about me. <laughs> so it was important that I also showed that I understood some of what they were saying. Also a lot of the work that we were doing within marketing would be in the local language. So just understanding the messages that were being said, it was important that I get a general um, sense. And so I've been with PSI now for about 11 years. After Congo, I went to Cote d'Ivoire, and I was the head of office there. Um, and it's very important working with different ministry officials, your staff, and so forth, um, speaking that language. And then now I've been back at headquarters, and I actually do a lot of hiring. Um, and one of the things that I'm always looking for is having somebody that has a foreign language. I will say that um, depending on the position, it's, we find it's harder to find French speakers. So those of you that are French speakers, it's great because in development, it's, um, it's great to have Spanish and Portuguese as well. Um, it's a little easier to find bilingual Spanish speakers in the US. Um, not to say that that's not important, but it does within development, it is a differentiator. And so even just starting to learn it, um, or even after you've graduated, continuing the language um, is really important because there's some jobs you just need in order to interact with our field offices, even if you're not going there day to day. Um, and I think it's just helpful and it shows your willingness to learn more about their culture, um, the different things, and there's some nuances as you get better at the language that you pick up, that you're able to pick up in English, but in a foreign language it takes a little time the subtleties. Um, so I use my language every single day. I work with a diverse group of people, um, not only Americans, but people from different regions, and then I constantly have to be interacting um, with them. So um, it adds credibility also to your experience. So I guess my in additional advice is the more languages you can get, the great, that's great. Um, it helps. It makes you stand out if you can speak a different language. And I guess for me, it's also getting that experience in the actual country as well. Um, it helps further your capabilities. I probably won't. I probably won't studies here at Colby. Um, had a really great experience doing so. Initially I wanted to go into business and uh, wanted to go down the economics route, but I just fell in love with the language um, and the culture um, and the food. Um, <laughs> so when I had the opportunity to go abroad, I didn't really understand what uh, learning Chinese would actually, um, how that would add value to my, to my future career. Um, and when I, for, I, I had studied the language for two years before, before um, going over there um, and didn't really understand how poor my Chinese skills were. I, I went to class, I went to, I, well, sorry, 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 yeah, I owe you a beer after this. But, but um, uh, I went there and uh, I kept the language pledge. And um, I, so what I will say is I developed a very strong foundation uh, of the language. It gave me the ability to pick it up much easier than I think a lot of the other students had. Um, I understood the sentence structure and I had a lot of that vocabulary, but actually getting that out and being able to speak it was, was a challenge initially. Hopefully I forgave myself. <laughs> um, so I think studying abroad was definitely a very valuable experience. It, it, it um, allowed me to become conversational. Um, and to Jen's point, I think understanding and, and being able to identify with the cultural 
uh, aspects of what being able to speak the language gives you is almost, if not as, as valuable as learning the language itself. Being able to relate to people on, on, on their terms is, 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 is so important. I mean, not even like within uh, America, but like across any sort of business platform or any sort of interactions. Um, be able to relate with people uh, through their languages. Like it's, this is something that, that we've been discussing a lot at school and something that we've been discussing a lot internally at the company that I work for. Um, so after coming back uh, uh, and, and graduating, I worked, uh, I, I found my job through the Colby Alumni Network um, at Arabica Roasters. This is uh, China's oldest specialty coffee roaster. Um, I, was, I knew I wanted to go back to China and I knew I wanted to uh, farther develop my language skills, um, and I reached out to Stuart, who's still there, uh, who's still roasting, and uh, who's still hiring interns from Colby. Uh, for those people that might be interested in going going uh, to work in China, um, and it wasn't really until I started managing uh, the the sales and marketing teams and managing people on a daily basis that my Chinese skills really started to improve. Um, and and it's it just incredibly valuable to be able to communicate with the people that you're working with. Um, I don't think I would have been able to excel or even been able to work there for as long as I did had I not been able to, to speak the language. Because um, there just wouldn't have been any way to, to communicate. Um, and so I, I worked there for two years and, and, and then decided I wanted to go back to school and, and knew I, I found a passion with coffee, uh, but I wanted to move one step up in the supply chain um, and work for the trading side of the business, um, which uh, has been a great transition <laughs> for me. Um, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, when I first started working there, languages, uh, having uh, the ability to speak a second language is sort of one of the requirements to work for, for a company like this. Um, almost everybody at least speaks uh, Spanish just because of where we source coffee from. There's a lot of uh, Spanish speaking countries like uh, Colombia, Mexico. Um, and no matter where you're going, you have to have the ability to speak a, a second language. Um, and, and a lot of my work, actually, um, over the summer was figuring out, we wanted to enter into the Chinese market and figuring out exactly what the strategy would, would be. And I was contacting and calling people in China to understand more about uh, what the Chinese coffee market looked like, um, the types of people, if we wanted to create an e-commerce platform that, and that how, how that would work. Um, and so I was still, still using my language skills to this day. Um, so I think it's definitely the most valuable part of my experience at Colby. Um, also, it was, I mean, it, it basically was all the courses that I took were Chinese. Um, and uh, I think From, the, from, from that perspective, it is just the most valuable thing that I, I got out of my Colby education. Um, and I would strongly urge everybody to, to grasp this, a second language. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, it, it really helps you be able to relate people uh, across cultures. Um, I think my advice to sort of graduating seniors or people that are interested in working abroad or, 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 or continuing to develop their language skills is, um, there are opportunities. There's plenty of opportunities out there, um, and so I could, I would go through the alumni network if you want to go through the the public sector or, or private sector. You, there, there's opportunities for both routes. I know a lot of people end up going to teach English in China, um, which I would strongly encourage. But there are opportunities to work for um, NGOs. There's opportunities to work in the private sector. Um, and I'm happy to speak with anybody uh, that'd be interested. What are you going to do with that? 
Right. Okay. Yeah, I got that a lot too. Um, but I think after listening to everyone, I can safely say that you can basically do anything you want with a language major. Um, I was a Spanish and Latin American studies major, and my path has been very windy since I graduated from Colby. Um, when I was here, I studied abroad in Argentina, and that was an incredible experience, and I had an opportunity to volunteer with an NGO there, and that sort of gave me that service learning portion that I think um, is sort of what Abby was saying about, you know, making your experience really meaningful and finding something that you can take with you in your career. So um, I would definitely recommend that. Um, but when I graduated, what I knew was that I wanted to maintain my Spanish speaking skills. And I didn't know how that was going to work. And I was living in Maine still with my parents for the first 10 months or so that I was out of college. And I was able to find a job as a bilingual customer service representative for an insurance company based in Portland. Um, I was the only non-native speaker who was hired. And there was a Spanish proficiency exam. And I absolutely credit my education to that because um, it was uh, native speakers interviewing me, making sure that if I was speaking with customers on an insurance basis that I would be able to communicate efficiently. Um, while I was working there though, I felt like there was a little bit of a void. I was someone who was always very active as a volunteer, working with children. So I decided to volunteer on the weekends at a medical center as a child life assistant. And it was there that I started to get the healthcare bug. But I was a little bit nervous about it because it wasn't what I did. I wasn't a science person. I didn't go to school for science. I hadn't taken any science classes except for chem for citizens or whatever that <laughs> rocks for jocks, whatever. <laughs> Anything to get out of doing it. <laughs> uh, and so I, I was a little bit, you know, nervous about making that transition. But while I was working at the hospital on that volunteer basis, um, a lot of the children coming in and out were wish children. So they were receiving wishes from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And so I went home one night and I Googled, and there happened to be an opening for a wish program coordinator in Boston, and the requirement was that you spoke Spanish. And I thought, oh, perfect, great, got this one. So I applied for the job, and I got it, and I spent the next two years in Boston, and I granted probably over 100 wishes to sick children, and I started to get that confidence level that I really did love healthcare and I loved working in nonprofit, but I wanted to do something more for the kids that I was seeing. I didn't want to just send them to Disney World and wave goodbye. I wanted to be at their bedside. So I decided, thank you also to Chris, my fiance in the back, who kind of pushed me along, um, that I could do it. I could go back to school, I could become a nurse. And so I started prerequisite courses worked for nonprofits as I was completing those courses, and we ended up moving out to Arizona, and it was in Arizona that I found a bilingual nursing program. 150 students applied to the program, 15 were taken. I was one of the 15, only not a native Spanish speaker. Again, I absolutely 100% credit that to my education here, because that speaks volumes, that the classroom prepared me, that my study abroad experience prepared me and that the level that we were expected to communicate at and you know write at and all of that really was at a native level. So I did the program, it took me two years, I graduated in December and I just accepted a position as a neuro ICU <coughs> RN out in Phoenix. And I will tell you that even throughout my clinical experiences, almost every single day I used Spanish to help patients who were terrified. And it made all the difference to them. So um, what I would say to you as advice is don't be afraid if you feel like the career path that you're interested in is not anything like what you expected it to be, go with it, it's okay. There are opportunities and your language skills and any type of international study, global studies, East Asian studies, whatever you are doing, um, that will help you better serve any person you come in contact with, whether it's at the corporate level, whether it's in law, whether it's in healthcare, teaching, you name it. Um, but what I would say is, 
If you are not sure what you want your path to be, the best way to both keep up any language and culture skills and also sort of hone in your ideas is through volunteer work. So if you're working in a job and you think this is absolutely not for me, but I need to make my payments on my car and my rent and all of that, we all get that. You have to have a job. Um, find something on the side that you can do as a volunteer. Go volunteer at a hospital. Go tutor students in a classroom. You know, there are plenty of opportunities, even here in Waterville. While I was at school here, I was an ESL tutor for a Colombian student who had just moved here. He was just adopted and he didn't know any English at all. And I went and sat in his classroom with him and helped translate and helped him understand English and his math and everything. Um, there are legal aid programs, as Abby mentioned. You know, there are a bazillion ways that you can get involved and you can really figure out what path it is that you belong on. But whatever it is you want to do, just know, as you heard today, that there are a thousand different ways to achieve your goals. And it might take some time and some patience, but this education that you're getting right now is absolutely going to help you do that. So I'm the panelist who's going to talk about some stuff that are a little bit different. Um, I'll actually tell you two quick stories. Um, number one, my story. So why did I choose Colby? I wanted to travel the world for a year, and my father looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. So I found a program with Colby where I could go to Salamanca, and I all I wanted to do was learn languages and be in another country and um, just learn. And it's that is, a, I credit that opportunity to so much, being 18 years old and getting on a plane and just going and not really knowing, but being the 20 peers, uh, I would say five to six are who are still my best friends uh, in this world uh, because we went on an adventure together uh, and had a great time and we learned a language. So as you kind of think about, you know, what do I do with, you know, these language skills, I kind of, Think about Mariah's question that she posed, you know, why major in the language? Um, how many of you will get why liberal arts? <laughs> so um, where I found myself on my journey is I work for a Fortune 100 large insurance company. I'm an executive recruiter. I hire their senior kind of strategic leadership um, folks, and I absolutely love it. So, if my advice to you guys is how do I take what I've learned here and translate it to whether it's private, NGO, wherever you want to go in this world, there are some great lessons that you've learned in being part of this major. Uh, number one we've talked about today is study abroad. So as you guys are interviewing and you're looking for that first job in the world, it doesn't matter who you're looking to work for, that's going to be some of the experiences that you are going to speak to because they were your most challenging moments, they were most successful moments. I remember being in Spain and I asked for a cucaracha instead of a cuchara. <laughs> you know, that, that moment stuck with me and it was fantastic. But I can also, uh, when I was in your spot and I was interviewing, I said, I love being thrown into anything. Throw me into it and I'll figure it out and that's where I'm at my best. So if you think about how do I take what I've done and how do you take these learnings and how do you translate it to how do I interview, okay? What are employers looking for? Um, there's always key core questions. Your first question is who are you? What have you done? And you want to really think about that question. You typically get about 30 minutes with someone during an interview, right? That question will set the tone for the rest of that 30 minutes. So really thinking about who you are and what you want to share, um, the building blocks that have made you you, that is really something to think about, number one, going into an interview. Number two, why this role in this opportunity? Number three, why this firm? And in, in your positions where you're looking right now, where do you want to be in five to ten years? You may know, you may not know. So
surprisingly, most of you, and you've probably heard it here today, you will not be with the first firm you join. But try to get into a good spot with a great training program where you can get great support to learn kind of the initial building blocks for your career. So those are some things to kind of think about. Um, and I absolutely use the study abroad, use learning a language um, as part of that. Now, how do you go kind of further on in your career? And I'll kind of go back to my own story again. Uh, it's so many firms think globally now. You have to think globally. So even though I haven't you know, necessarily been back to Spain or been at, back to Argentina, and I'm not using Spanish on a daily basis, the great thing that I know is when our international uh, business unit wants to build out their executive search team, I have building blocks. I can do it. And I've already planted the seeds to say, hey, when you guys are ready, let me know, I'll go anywhere. Let's go. Uh, I have some of the language skills. Because if, as you're applying and you're looking for jobs, people want people, they, the people who are interviewing want you to stretch, right? And they want you to want that, that role and that opportunity. But they also want to hear that you've done a piece of it. So I can always say, I've done that. I've lived in Spain. I've lived in Argentina. I know how to be in a country where I don't know the language. I'm fine. And, and so using that to know that you can kind of take this and, and make it your own, whether it is part of your day to day, and it's what you live, eat, and breathe, or you're just bettering yourself to become someone great in a global environment. Uh, the other point that I was kind of thinking about where uh, that folks were sharing today, when you learn a language in, in very close to language is also culture. So you're not only learning that language, you're learning kind of how to interact with others and how to read others and how to how to play up their cues. Uh, that's something, whether it's wherever you take your career, is going to be so crucial because you're not going to be a one man on an island. You need to know how to work with your peers, how to work above, how to work below. And I think I credit a lot of kind of learning a language and being in another country where you can't always get all the, all exactly what everybody's saying, but you're using other, other points and other kind of facial expressions and, and, and body expressions to understand. And I think that's really important um, as you engage with others kind of throughout your career. But 
I think that really helps. And also, I lived with a host family who only spoke Spanish, so I was really forced into it. Um, forced in a good way, because I mean, I enjoyed it. But I think that studying abroad is really, I mean, yeah, you can go on a great program, but it's also really what you make of it yourself. So I think to stretch yourself and challenge yourself to really you know, stick to only speaking the, the language um, and to resist the temptation to just fall back to English. And I know it's harder, easier said than done, but um, in my own experience, students who do that come back um, and you know, their language skills just improve amazingly. So that's, that's my thing. Yeah, I'm, I'll just jump in real quick. I mean, I think it is definitely about picking the right, the right, the right program um, and, and being lucky enough to have a good group of people that you're there with. Uh, like when I studied abroad, we, we took a language pledge and nobody broke the language pledge. Um, and they were very selective of the, the, uh, the students that you'd be paired with. So uh, I lived with a, a, a Chinese guy and we spoke Chinese, that's it. So, uh, and, and I think that they were pretty upfront with him like, hey, the, you know, you're hosting these students and this is like what, what the expectations are. So. Um, I think you should really just like research the programs and, and definitely stick to your guns of just saying, okay, I'm going to speak this language. I don't mean to be rude, but <laughs> yeah. No English. Yeah, but no English, yeah. <laughs> um, Jen, I was wondering if you could speak more about your transition between thinking about being an engineer and then switching to gear completely, um, and when in your Kobe career you thought of that and yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the great things I loved is going to a liberal arts school because it's hard to know if you're at age 17 or 18 what you're actually going to do. Um, at least that was my case, which is the beauty of it as, a, as well. Um, so we had to do a language class, so I was taking that. Um, I think as I started, um, I thought that I wanted to do hard sciences. Um, I did fine at it, but I wasn't as passionate about it. And I remember just kind of soul searching and there, I don't know if it still exists, the computer science lab was in mud building and there was no exterior windows either. <laughs> so that further adds to, I don't know if that still exists. Like, no, but, no, no, okay. No, there's a green building. Okay. It was like that when I was here. I will say that's also, we did not have internet in our rooms. In fact, internet was just starting. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh gosh, this is very loud. Um, so for me, it just, I started to do more soul searching, trying to understand what did I like, talking to different professors as well, um, seeing what was out there and trying to take advantage of the different networks and so forth. And so that's really when I started seeing that I liked kind of the math and science of things and I liked economics. Um, and I think that was a nice bridge. But then I also love learning about people. I'm a people person. So I also love understanding the world and how it operates and just being exposed to different people. So it was really just that realization of, well, what would I do with this job? I could do it, but I'm, I'm passionate. And I think it goes back to when you're graduating college, if you, if you have a great education here, go out and live. It's OK to me. It's OK if you do a bunch of different things. In fact, those are the interesting stories. And in fact, I am somebody that advocates that you don't go to grad school right after undergrad. In fact, I will say when I see that when I'm hiring, I quickly kind of toss it to the side unless you've had some interesting experiences that added or a different career path. Um, because you haven't lived and you haven't worked. Most people, there's different cases always. Um, so I think that's where you get to, to figure, it, figure it out. So it was just kind of by happenstance that I kind of got to that. And just from the executive recruiter point of view, I absolutely agree. Um, I think it's really good. I need to speak up a little bit. We've got some. Oh, yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me now? Um, I think it's um, great to go out and get real world experience before you go get uh, a graduate degree. Um, it's it's it will make you a more desirable candidate to have both the real world knowledge as well as um, the academic knowledge as well. Could you speak a little bit more, Beth, to, yes. we've been asked recently to articulate the employable skills mm -hmm. of, um, well, in, I'm in humanities, so it's yeah. for um, a lot of, well, actually most of you in here, and I'm not 
saying what you're doing in social sciences is not important, but I think it's the humanities that have been under siege. So when you, and you're hiring as well? Are all of you hiring in a, no? <laughs> it's all right. I, maybe I want a job. Uh, but, but could you put that in concrete terms? So you look at a, somebody's applied, yeah. and they're coming out of a liberal arts background. What do you see that the language and the interdisciplinary work across these studies were thinking about? What, what skills are they bringing that other candidates are not? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I was starting to go there when I said, you know, why would look liberal, liberal arts? Um, you need to be able to very clearly and concise, concisely tell people. I was taught to consume information, ponder information, understand what the story is, and tell that story in an articulate manner. That is so crucial in today's world, whether it's on a slide deck, whether it's understanding data and data points, what is that data telling me? What is the story behind this? It's, that is hands down one of the things that's, that employers are looking for most. How can you under, how can you take in disparate pieces of information and help us create a better business situation? The answers are not there. You know, when you start to go out there into the real world, the answers are not there. You need to learn, and you know, it, it, you can probably kind of speak well to being in graduate school right now. You need to learn and kind of look at case studies. How did everybody? How did everybody do it? What's my idea? How are we going to market this? How are we going to market this in, in France? How are we going to market this in Spain? Well, you have to learn and you have to study and you have to think about that. And then you have to pitch people on ideas and get that buy-in. So when I look at liberal arts education, I think um, people who can generally uh, write well, people who are articulate, uh, and people who understand uh, a myriad of things and are going to be able to put different pieces together. It doesn't need to be all engineering. It's not going to be supply chain management. I'm going to have more of a big thinker. I think. I joke around, one of my VPs who's heads up one of our claims business lines, who went to MIT and he's an English major. I said, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but he, he's brilliant. He's one of those guys who can play chess with his eyes, with, with, with the, a blindfold. And what he's great at is he can understand information and he can put it in a format that others understand and help them make strong business decisions. Yeah, I think for me it's also how you weave your story and what pieces you take from the different classes you've been doing, the different activities, and how that helps you in your job. And I think having that diversity of experience is always great, that global vision. And a lot of times I might ask questions that throw people off. Um, you know, tradition, I ask a lot of maybe business school class, you know, like how many pennies would you fill in this room? And you see some people panic saying, I don't know how many. I don't care the answer, I don't even know the answer, but it's thinking through what's your thought process, and I think that's where I felt that probably gave me such a great um, background, and because I had to take certain all these different classes, it helps me think about things differently and solve problems in different ways and have a new perspective um, in the way you do that. And that's what you want when you're working with people is a diversity of experiences and thoughts so that ultimately your end product, project or product is far better than it would be if everyone was Anybody else want to speak to that? Well, I think I, Beth brought up an interesting point earlier um, that I, I just wanted to touch on. Um, of when I was sitting in your guys' shoes, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew I was graduating, and I knew I needed to get a job. I think, like that was the logical next step that I heard people did. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, <laughs> I, um, I just went out and I, 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 I knew that, that sort of, I'm a salesperson, so I knew I liked talking to people and I, I knew that I could be good at that. Um, and I wasn't as, I wasn't very picky. Um, my thought process was, I'll get a job and I'll, I'll know at the very least, I'll find something that I don't want to do for the rest of my life. And in, in doing so, I actually learned a lot of very valuable skills that 
um, allowed me to accelerate my career when I was working in China and, and where I currently am. Um, and I think that's what's most important is don't really get too bogged down about thinking, okay, I need to find something, I need to find my passion, I need to understand what I want to do uh, with, with life, but more of, um, okay, let me just pick up some skills, learn some, some real hard skills that I can that I can translate into and, and then find out what I want to do later in life. Um, I think that's sort of, I, you, you touched on that, I think that's really important and um, sort of took the anxiety out of trying to find uh, a long term career. Um, and then coffee just sort of fell into my lap um, after that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's really great stress if you are graduating and finding that perfect job in your career field. I mean, you can worry about that when you decide what you want to do for a game or if you go to grad school or whatever. Um, I know many people that have career shifted as well. Yeah. Um, and grad school is a good opportunity for that. I also think that um, doing internships, I mean, I never have taken an internship that wasn't paid. So there are ones out there that are paying if it's a small bit. And actually, a lot of the people we hire at the entry level, we're taking from the pool of our interns because then we get to know them. And so I would think about that as a step, and also it could be understanding the organization in which you're, you know, if it's a big organization, the job per se might not be the job that you want to do, but if you're in the right organization, then it will open up opportunities, and then you can try out you know, different things. Please. Yes. So this is more specific to Abby. So um, I know you said that you did the uh, abroad program in Santiago, right? Mm -hmm. Where did you do your ESL program in the city? Sorry, where did you say you, you worked on, you started ESL teaching, right? Oh, or, yes. Or English teaching. Mm -hmm. English teaching yes. Um, yeah, I was also in Santiago. In Santiago, right. Mm -hmm. And then, also just a quick random question. As a Vermont, you work from Vermont, are you? Oh, I'm from Montpelier. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, are you from Vermont, too? Yeah, Manchester. Okay, oh, sure. <laughs> So either from your own experience, if you care to share, or from the other side of the table, mistakes to avoid in your interviews. Patrice, could you? So yeah. So either from your own personal experience, if you care to um, humiliate yourself, or from the other side, Jen and Beth, you've been hiring. What are mistakes to avoid, or what are some of those moments of, oh my god, I can't believe I or that person just said <laughs> Just a couple. My favorite sometimes is when they don't know, they want to apply to a bunch of jobs at PSI, and I work in reproductive health, and then they start saying, well, I'm really interested in malaria, and it's like, well, you got to tailor your answer to person. <laughs> I think being, knowing the organization, people that don't do their homework, I sniff that out. And even, you have to think that it's the best place that you ever wanted to work, even if it's, you're applying to many other places. Um, I find with a language specifically, uh, if it's a job that, or in all my jobs, I'm gonna ask you about your language. And if it's a language I don't speak, I'm gonna bring somebody in. And so you should always be prepared to speak a language. Um, even, and one thing I've learned with language is, is that you're gonna make mistakes, but you have to have the confidence. It's okay, I've lived in places, you know, making mistakes, but actually people are pretty accepting of it, and at least you try. Um, so being prepared, you know, and if you put down fluent, you better speak it pretty well. Um, so, uh, and a lot of people, and they don't change it over time, if you know, you were at one point, but then it changes. Be honest about that. Um, I think also just dressing professionally. Um, some people come, you'd be amazed when they come in. And for me, it's always eye contact and being concise. And some of those questions that um, Beth talked about, having your answers. The flip is they're often going to ask you, what are you not strong at? Or where have you made a mistake um, that you've fallen down or what you've learned from it? And trying to think of those answers that, you know, it's not like, oh, I worked too hard, but thinking through something, sometimes people are too honest, <laughs> and, you know, you have to balance that. <laughs> so. I just wanted to follow up with the, the dressing correctly. I was part of the search just last month in my office, and um, a candidate came in, and she was great. Like, we loved her, except for she wore jeans, and it really, like, she didn't get hired. I mean, it wasn't the only reason, but it definitely, like, put a, like, a very sour, like, on her, on her whole interview. So 
like this voice. I mean, it's like a no-brainer, but it's really important to, to look your best when you're, when you're going to an interview. I will say, because I'm a little old school, I love handwritten thank you notes and or at least email thank yous. Um, so. Yeah, so just to jump on the thank you note, always write a thank you note, four sentences, do not write any more, do not write any less. You don't win, in, win a role because of an interview, but you will lose it. Um, so grammatically correct, check your spelling, do not send it from your phone because it could come out in different fonts, in different font sizes, <laughs> and with different spacing. Just get on the laptop and send it. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, what not to do and what, what to do, um, it's, you really need a nice combination of confidence and humility. That's what people want to see. Um, you want passion, but not too much passion. Uh, it, you know, it's. But you want to you want to let people know that you're you're confident in your abilities, but you're willing to work hard, and you're looking for an opportunity to do that. Um, that phrase will win you over more than than, than I can even describe to you guys. Um, but it's you need that humility as well. Um, definitely do your research. So. Just like you were going through your college search, every firm has a different culture. Uh, so you're expected to act and kind of think in a different way. So um, our, our firm, we, we have a, a huge hub out in Seattle. So we, we look at some Amazon folks. Amazon's a fantastic, fantastic firm. Uh, but a lot of what drives them is you're, you have to be a, a subject matter expert and you want to really be able to confidently describe what your expertise is, and it can come across in art culture as a little combative. So it's talking to people who are there and using the Colby Alumni Network. Um, I know people reach out to me and, and just saying, hey, you know, what's the firm or what's the culture like? For, for us, we have to be collaborative. So if you don't come across as going to be a strong team player, that even though that's, that's just the culture of the firm that that person's used to. So, so do that, that, that legwork to understand what that, that culture is. Um, what else not to do? I feel like I could write a book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't over contact the people. Uh, it turns me off after a while. I mean, it's one thing, I definitely use the alumni network for people who are hiring. There's so many uh, CVs that we get that, um, and I'd also, I find, People coming out of college, they'll put all their college groups that they're in, and there might be 20. Mm -hmm. And you need to prioritize based on what you think might fit best within the organization. Um, so just keeping that in um, mind. Um, but definitely, I get I am very willing to talk to different people from Colby. I always enjoy it because I also recognize that I understand the brand and the effort. <laughs> and so I would love to have more Colby people at PSI. There's three of us. Um, there's also a Bates person as well, <laughs> but actually we're more alike than some of the other people, especially when we talk about sports. <laughs> Patriots winning. Um, so. and, and one thing off of that, um, be articula articulate, be clear and concise, but not too concise. So that first question, so tell me about yourself. You need to practice that. You need to practice that in a mirror, you need to practice it in the car, on the way to the interview, or maybe not on the subway, but <laughs> practice it, um, tell it to your friend, tell it to your significant other, um, you, 30 minutes, that should be no longer than two minutes, maybe a minute and a half at most. So you want to have, really, really have that down. Um, I screen people constantly, all day. I hit the 12 minute mark and I haven't said a word. That's not good. Even though I may absolutely love the person, you need to be able to be concise, be articulate, and I, I don't want to work with you if you're just going to talk all the time. I think just, I have two final quickly to say. Um, one is, you know, at the end I always ask, do you have any questions for me? And so always having a couple of questions that show you've done your research, but then also gauging if the person is kind of getting lost eyes and kind of being quiet, stop talking as Beth was saying. And then just that, um, when you do get your job, I always recommend people should try to negotiate. 
Um, and I particularly say that for women, because women tend not to. So it can't hurt. It's not like the, they're going to take away the job. It's They can just say, no, we can't offer it. Um, but make sure you negotiate. Mm -hmm. Salary? Yeah, sal yeah, salary. And there's other ways. We have time for one more, yeah, and then we'll go upstairs and eat and have a more informal conversation. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, in those one or two minutes that you, you're supposed to talk about, you said how much should be academic, professional, personal, how much, how, how should you negotiate? I think it's going it, to, it really depends on your own story, right, and where you are in your career. If I'm interviewing now, um, I'm a high level kind of touch upon this, the fact that I studied abroad my first semester of college, just because that's an additive point for me and helps me explain me. Um, but where you are, it's your employer wants to know who you are. So your story, like, hey, I grew up in D.C., you know, whatever your particular story is, they're going to want to know that. And how have you made it through? How are you resilient? Um, how do you kind of fight through things? How have you been successful? How have you pushed forward? That, those are the questions that I would try to incorporate in that story. Yeah, I think um, something, another point to, to touch on is just uh, when I'm looking to hire somebody, I'm looking for somebody that I'm going to be able to like get along with also. So um, I try to make those interviews much more of a conversation um, than, than really like, you know, shooting questions at somebody and, and bouncing and trying to get their answers. But uh, I'm looking for somebody that I'm going to be able to work with and not get fed up with halfway through the day and somebody that I can trust, somebody that I know, okay, you have these responsibilities and I know that you're gonna do them and do them well, where I'm not gonna have, it's not gonna create more work for me. Um, so I really just wanna make sure that I'm gonna get along with this person and that I can, that I know that they'll, they'll get done what I'm hiring them to do. Yeah, we always have the same, would you wanna have a beer with them? Yeah, exactly. It depends on the individual. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's how the culture thing Definitely. is a big fit. And I think now with LinkedIn, that you can also, people that you're going to be interviewing with, it's helpful to get a little bit of their background because then if you can make yeah, some sort of connection, yeah. yeah, then you can. Sorry. No, no, definitely. That's it. Well, this has been so rich. Thank you so very much. You know where it is, so we'll see you there.